Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to talk to you again. Um, I'm going to present a very short work on um, one of the topics we have been working for many years, uh, which is the impulse radiating antenna. This work uh, well, is co-authored by uh, Fernando Barrasin, uh, Chauki Kasmi, and uh, Pahatal Jaffe from uh, all from Direct Energy Research Center here in Abu Dhabi. So uh, this is the outline of the of the talk. I will present um, background on the impulse radiating antenna. Then I'm going to uh, explain what is the approach, the, what is the conventional approach for connecting the impulse radiating antenna uh, using an impedance transformer to a 50 ohm generator. And afterwards, I'm going to go straight to the, our proposed solution, which is the use of a progressive impedance um, feeders for the impulse radiating antenna. So uh, I'm going to present a very uh, brief background on how an impedance, uh, how an impulse radiating antenna works. Uh, this is an antenna that um, was developed by uh, Professor Carl Baum in 1989, was published the first time. Uh, this antenna has many advantages for the radiation of short pulses. And uh, one of the main advantages of this antenna in that regard is that it presents a very low spatial and frequency dispersion over a lar large band, uh, band of frequencies. Um, it can radiate hyperband pulses. I mean, uh, these are pulses with a fractional band ratio or with a, with a band ratio of uh, more than 10. And additionally, this antenna can manage uh, high voltage, uh, as high voltage, short rise time, short rise time uh, feeding pulses, which is an advantage when you want to radiate, of course, high power electromagnetic signals. The combination of these features makes the impulse radiating antenna an effective radiator uh, of ultra wideband high amplitude electromagnetic signals. Basically, on the, in the, on the diagram on the, on the right, well, you can see that you have the excitation voltage on the apex of these two TEM feeders located uh, here, these triangular plates. Um, then there you produce, you manage to produce, if you manage to produce some excitation voltage, which is here um, represented by this square signal differential, know, plus minus. Then uh, the other part of the antenna is these terminating radiators that are going to somehow absorb the wave when it arrives to the extremity of the transmission of this uh, transmission line that is formed by the feeders. And the other element of the antenna, it's a parabolic reflector that is going to, of course, um, send the wave in the other direction in a, a planar waveform. In this, uh, in this graphic, you can, be, uh, you can see uh, how the antenna works in a more uh, graphical way. So you have the feeding voltage, which is a step discharge very fast, and of course, of a very high amplitude. Uh, feeding the uh, TEM plates. So between the plates, you are going to have a spherical wave that is going to start propagating towards the reflector. Of course, on the other side of the plates, you also have some uh, radiation that is going to go in the other way. So we have here, we split here the same wavefront in two, in two colors, the red color and the dashed black color, in order to show two different processes that are going to occur in the, in the antenna. So the spherical wave starts uh, propagating towards the reflector, as you can see here. And at some point, the red wavefront is going to arrive to the reflector and is going to be reflected in the opposite direction. And then you will have the reflected wave from the, uh, from the uh, reflector is going to form a 
plain wave front. And you can see here that in the center, the, 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 the arrows are thicker, representing that the amplitude is uh, higher in the center and smaller um, up and down. And you have also the pre-pulse signal that is radiated towards the observer. You can see here in this, uh, in this graph, um, the pre-pulse that arrived uh, earlier to the observer and the main poles that arrived later produ uh, produced by the reflection on the uh, parabolic reflector. Of course, the main poles is uh, higher in amplitude than the, um, the pre-poles. Also observe that here you have some undershot. This is the compensation. Uh, this negative part is necessary because of course, no uh, DC um, signal can be radiated. So this is a compensation that the same uh, antenna does. This is a model that represents the early stages of the radiation. Some of the things can happen if you have, for example, reflection on the, um, uh, on the, uh, these resistors that are supposed to absorb the wave. Oh, these are some examples of large uh, impulse radiating antennas that has been built um, in this community, there are many of the of the of this uh, work was done uh, around New Mexico, uh, 90s and in the, in, the, in the first decade of the of the 21st century. So this one is the one of the prototype. I think the first prototype of the uh, impulse radiating antenna, as you can see, is a very large reflector, 3.66 meters in diameter and uh, can radiate four kilovolts per meter at three, uh, 300 meters of distance. The rise time of this signal you can see here is very short and it's in the order of uh, it's less than 100 picoseconds. This was published of course in Transactions and Plasma Science in 1997. On the right you have you know, the larger of these uh, reflectors in terms of uh, radiated field. Uh, this was called um, Jolt. Uh, it was able to radiate 60 kilovolt per meter at 85 meters of distance. In the first case, in the case of the prototype full era, the feeding voltage was plus minus 60 kilovolts. In the case of the Jolt, the um, feeding voltage was feeding voltage was uh, one megavolt. You can see here the figure, the electric field uh, radiated. This is, these are examples of large uh, reflectors, of large uh, electromagnetic uh, reflectors, uh, electromagnetic pulses radiated by these uh, large eras. So, but there are other examples of medium and small size eras uh, with other applications more in uh, laboratories, EMC testing, EMI, lab testing, and other general purpose. Like for example, here on the on the on the first the first two antennas on the left, manufactured by Everett Farr and his company. Well, you can see here a high um, high frequency impulse radiating antenna. Next, you can see a collapsible uh, impulse radiating antenna. So this one can collapse and is a very portable device. Uh, in the center, you can see a prototype developed uh, a product developed by Montana. You can see here that this is a 1.8 meters uh, half reflector. And on the right, you can see a prototype uh, I manufactured during my PhD uh, at EPFL. So this all, or this all are examples where you fit the antenna through a coaxial cable in, in all, this, in all the, the examples that are now in this, on the screen. On the previous one, you, fit, you, you were supposed to fit the antenna through the focal point. So the source of, of the, um, the source of the electromagnetic radiation, the fast pulse is located directly on the focal point of the antenna. Whereas here you produce um, the excitation with a coaxial cable, uh, sorry, with a, with a generator and you bring this excitation to the focal point of the antenna with a coaxial cable. In two, different, in two different approaches as is shown here. So in the cable fed antenna, 
uh, you have in the first case, you have your voltage generator, you have a balloon because you have to produce plus minus, uh, you know, a differential uh, signal in, into the TEM feeders. Uh, in the second one, you have uh, also a pulse generator and you are transporting this into the uh, half impulse radiating antenna and you are connecting your pulse generator to the antenna using a transform uh, impedance transformer. Whereas in the focal point fed antenna or impulse radiating antenna, like the two, like the JOL, for example, or like the prototype era, you have um, high voltage DC or, or a slow pulse, then you manage to transport this energy towards a fast switch that is situated, uh, is located exactly at the focal point of the antenna. And when the breakdown conditions are uh, achieved in the, in the spark gap that is formed, in the switch that is formed in the focal point, then you have the rest of the process there. So in the, in the case of the half in, impulse radiating antenna, well, this, this, the setup is similar, just that it is referred to ground. Um, this is a very important distinction because we are gonna talk today about this prototype, you know, the, on the left down, you know, half impulse radiating antenna that is fed to a coaxial cable. These geometries are generally uh, used with uh, off the shelf generators, you know, pulse generators in the order less than 75 kilovolts uh, voltage, peak voltage, hundreds or, or less than 100 picoseconds is usual. But also this, uh, this situation might arrive when you have, uh, for example, any 50 ohm uh, equipment connected to the impulse radiating antenna, per perhaps a radio frequency generator, uh, perhaps a, a BNA or any other equipment with 50 ohms, either in reception or in transmission. So um, this talk I'm going to present today, it's, it's related to this um, lower left geometry in general. It can be applied to the other three geometries, but we are still uh, working on it. So the con conventionally, how uh, uh, half conventionally how this problem is solved? I mean, how do you go from a pulse generator to the antenna uh, using an impedance transformer? Well, in order to understand that, I'm going to go quickly through the theory of the stereographic projection and the electric fields in the antenna because we need to understand why do we have uh, impedance transformer between the generator and the antenna? Why cannot we connect directly? Um, the generator and the antenna. What, what prevents this to happen? I mean, I, I need to explain first what is the problem. So in order to do that, we will, we will go quickly to, um, to the fields, the field distribution in the aperture of the reflector. So here you have the spherical wavefront between the two plates in a, hull, in a full impulse radiating antenna. So if we perform what is called the stereographic projection, we are able to project the fields which are on the spherical wavefront into a projecting plane behind the reflector. After the, um, the reflection of the wave on, the, on, this, on, the, um, on this reflector, we're gonna have something that is similar to stereographic projection. So these projected fields can be seen, uh, the projected geometry can be seen in this, uh, in this um, image in the center where we are going to have now on this projection, on this projecting plane, a uh, 2D um, geometry formed by these two plates uh, here with dimensions B1 and B2 uh, related to the length of the, of the arms and the aperture angles of the, um, of the um, TEM feeders. The fields, the, 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 the potential on this, uh, the potential on this plane can be found using uh, this expression here developed by uh, Moon and Spencer in, 1990s, in 1977, where the, they use the um, inverse Jacobi function. Uh, perhaps the expression is, uh, is, 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 is from earlier, I'm not sure, but I'm sure that I saw this first time in the, the, in the book of Moon Spencer. 
uh, I think so. So why is this important? This is important because this parameter here, M, is related directly to the impedance of the to the impedance of the input impedance of the antenna. So the aperture fields of the antenna and the impedance of the antenna are closely related, are, are, are very um, connected through this parameter M. Because this parameter M appears in the um, potential distribution in the, in the cell potential, basically, distribution on the aperture field of the antenna. And of course, with the potential, you can obtain the electric field. And with electric field, you can obtain the radiated field if you integrate this um, expression using the Huygen principle. Huygen principle. So uh, you can see here on the, on the, on the, on the right, this expression, this, uh, this electric field distribution, which is not, uh, is, is, is um, calculated using the gradient of the pseudo potential on the plane. So you can see that the field, it's uh, very intense around the plate, around the plates, and it's not that intense here. But the important is to, to see that the electric field and the impedance of the, of the feeders, which is the impedance, the input impedance of the antenna, are connected through this parameter M. It means that if, if I cannot choose freely the uh, input impedance of the antenna, because when, I change, when I'm changing the input impedance of the antenna, I'm also changing the aperture fields of the reflector. And with this, I can be affecting the efficiency of the antenna or the electric field radiated by the antenna. This is the key of the issue. So this is for the case where the original, uh, this is the, for the case where the, um, where the uh, TM feeders are constant impedance like this. So this is the status quo. So the performance of the antenna can be defined using one of these three metrics, uh, the power and gain, the power gain and, and voltage gain defined by Everett Farr in 1993. Uh, power gain is um, the, um, the upper two height of the antenna divided by the square root of the uh, geometric factor impedance. Um, the gain voltage is the upper two height divided by the, by the geometric factor. Um, Scott Tile defined the thing in a different way. Scott talks about aperture efficiency and he defined the aperture efficiency as the integral of the electric field uh, in y direction on the plates of the aperture divided, uh, normalized to the upper to the area of the of the reflector itself. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, well, it matters, but it doesn't matter that much because at the end of the day, the three factors are connected through through this expression. So again, it doesn't matter what kind of metrics you use. Uh, at the end of the day, you end up having to consider very closely the relationship between the input impedance of the antenna and whatever metric you use. I mean, if you use um, aperture efficiency, you are going to find here FG. If you use um, power gain voltage, power gain, you're gonna find also HG. Uh, this is important because uh, for, the, for, 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 for many reasons, but especially, especially because um, Dr. Farr uh, defined this metric in one of his in one of his papers, and he arrived to the conclusion that the maximum power gain, um, the maximum power gain we can obtain is around 0.9, and it corresponds to um, input impedance of the antenna of 300 ohms around that point. So you can see here in the in this graph that uh, when the antenna has an impedance, input impedance of around 300 ohms, you have the maximum figure of merit or the maximum metric and the best performance in this antenna. This is basically the conclusion of what I'm introducing here, the uh, figure of merits. Uh, in general, this value is uh, rounded to 400 ohms. I mean, 300 is the optimum, but usually it gets rounded to 400 ohms. Not usually, everybody round this to 400 ohms for the case of uh, reflectors fed with a cable. And with this, 
you are you can do many many things many interesting things for example you can uh, produce balloons you can produce um, transformers that are multiple of 50 ohms this is basically the idea so in general a, a four a two arms a two arms uh, input radiating antenna is going to be 400 ohms a four arms input radiating antenna is going to be 200 ohms in the case of the um, in the case of the half input radiating antenna the impedance the optimum quotes is not optimum you know it's a little bit less than the optimum but it's the convenient is going to be 100 ohms and this is the, this is the case i mean your generators your generator is your off the shelf generator is 50 ohms your antenna is 100 ohms of course you can connect this directly uh, but of course having a good impedance matching impedance it's uh, uh, it's something that uh, is desirable uh, also uh, by doing what they're going to present here you obtain secondary effects that are, that are good uh, so basically what is done that what is done in this case is that you have your pulse generator you have an imp imp impedance transformer and here you have your 100 ohms entry 50 ohms entry here and you have this circuit on the right where you have your uh, uh, generator impedance transformer that slowly increases from 50 to 100 ohms and the half eta can be represented by these two transmission line uh, which are each one the team feeders and at the end very important you have these terminating resistors that are supposed to trap the wave after radiation this is basically uh, the, 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 the uh, state of the art so the radiated field is going to be the transfer function of the generator multiplied by the uh, the inverse of the effective length of the antenna which is basically the transfer function of the antenna multiplied by the uh, voltage um, generator here this is based, this is the, um, uh, the you can calculate the radiated field and frequency domain using this simple formula inside the transfer function of the antenna i have here also included the um, voltage divider between vg the impedance of the generator and the impedance of the transformer so um, these transformers generally are coaxial transformers you have here one very simple one which is a very simple transformer two cones one inside the other or you can have something more fancier like an exponential transformer in, in both cases you have impedance variation from 50 ohm to 100 ohms here this is like um, exponential of an exponential and in the second case is an exponential variation now um, our our new strategy um, is trying to overcome the use of this uh, transformer and uh, the idea is, is pretty simple this is the circuit i just uh, show you in red uh, well we have here the impedance transformer and in red we have the transfer function of the transformer in the equation now our approach is is the following our approach is um well we have the generator which is 50 ohms output and now the uh, the plates are going to be not constant in impedance they are going to to go from whatever is the uh, whatever parallel here give you in give you um matching here so if you have 50 ohm here you want each one of these parallel to have 100 ohms so 100 ohms in parallel gonna give you 50 and at the end we will have the 200 200 ohms um resistors why do we have 200 ohm resistors because i want at the end of the of the feeders to have the same electric field distribution i had in the first case i mean i want to be in the optimum in terms of the power gain that's the reason i kept here these 200 ohms resistors i don't i i don't want to change that because if, if i move this i will move the optimal point where i am operating with the with the antenna this work with 200 ohms or with 500 ohms with, with the with the value of impedance you want to put there uh, uh, by the way so my new trans transfer function my new electric field is going to be given by the transfer function of the the combined uh, two uh, transmission lines 
multiplied by the same expression, uh, the effective length, one divided by the effective length, effective length of the antenna, multiplied by the uh, in, uh, input, by the um, uh, voltage at the generator. So basically, if I can, what I, what I want with this is I don't want to lose. If I don't want to lose, I need to TF be almost at least equal to TT or, or higher. Otherwise, I'm going to lose. I mean, I'm going to show you that we can we can have exactly the same value. We haven't we haven't been able to produce more, but at least with this technique, you avoid the use of the external generator um, external um, impedance transformer, which is uh, shown here in this graph. I mean, in the in the traditional strategy, you have the impedance transformer. On this new strategy, you lose the TM feeders with this uh, triangular shape, and you have something that is going to be of a very um, uh, curved shape, shape, but you, you are going to uh, avoid the use of the impedance transformer. The advantage, of course, you don't need an external transformer as the input impedance of the antenna is going to be directly 50 ohms. A possible disadvantage is that the manufacturing of the plates will require CNC, that's true. However, 2D CNC uh, metal cutting is uh, quite standard in most uh, mechanical workshops uh, today. This is nothing, uh, you know, very advanced. And on the other hand, however, manufacturing the external transformer, in any case, will require to use a 3D CNC or a latent. So at the end of the day, it's going to be more expensive manufacturing, in any case, the impedance transformer than having you, your, uh, ten, your um, uh, variable resistor, uh, variable uh, impedance uh, feeders. That's at the end of the day what you gain with this technique. So um, the idea is to improve the adaption while ma maintaining the optimal aperture field. So you see here the feeder design, traditional feeder design. So you have here your equations for the impedance of the traditional design. Our proposed strategy is to have a progressive impedance so now the impedance is going to be a function of the distance between the focal point and the, and the resistors, basically. Uh, R is the radial distance. And now my, uh, my factor M, which is the key of, of, of all the, the things, is going to be a function of the distance between this focal point and this uh, um, resistor. At the beginning, I want the impedance I, I need, which is 100 ohms, and at the end, I want the impedance I need, which is 200 ohms, or whatever you need. Uh, also, the aperture angles of this um, black profile are going to be given by these two expressions. Uh, in the first case, the aperture angles were constant. Uh, now, they are not constant. They need to vary, to, 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 to change. Solving this expression is not trivial. It can be done. Uh, it can be done, but it's not trivial. Uh, it, 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 it must be done numerically. But once you do it, once uh, it can be done, you know, by, for, every, for, for every time you need to, to produce the same profile. Um, so here are side by side the two approaches. So in, on the left is the new approach, variable impedance feeder, where you have, um, where you have the, uh, the new expression for the input impedance. And on the left, on the right, you have um, the, um, uh, the transformer. But in this case, I'm going to do it with a very special profile. So in this case, I'm, ex I'm doing an example here using an exponential profile, because now the question is, where is Fz? Fz can be whatever you want, but of course, there are some profiles that has been tested in the literature for transforming impedances, and that's are the usual suspects. So we're going to go, for example, for the exponential, which is uh, easy to solve analytically. So uh, I have here the equation for the analytical uh, um, e example. So my impedance now is going to be Z1 exponent um, alpha, uh, alpha R, where alpha is a factor given by one divided by the length of the transformer and the, log and the natural logarithm of the ratio between the two uh, final and initial impedances. 
like shown here. On the other hand, if I do this with a constant impedance feeder, I will do it if I want to compare uh, apples with apples, well, I will need the impedance um, transformer to be of the same, le of the same length that the, um, that the feeders here in order to be comparable. So my function is going to be the same, but the input impedance is going to be 50 ohm because I'm going to connect 50 ohms at, the, at this extreme, extreme, and at the end, I'm going to connect 100 ohms. So notice that there are some similarities, the length is the same, and the ratio between the two impedances is the same. And this is the key that why this works. In this example, the focal to diameter distance is 0.5, and the, upper, and the diameter of the reflector is one meter. It's just, it's just an example. Um, now, what happens when, when, when you uh, connect this to a 10 kilovolts generator, with uh, 160 picoseconds rise time. So what, what you're gonna have is, is this, we simulated this using CST and the results of the full wave simulation uh, radiated at 10 meters of distance shows that the proposed design produced 1,500 uh, and something um, volts per meter at 10 meters distance and the traditional era produced the same exactly the same value. So results are practically identical. So what I'm showing here, okay, is the, the result is the same, but you are obtaining the same result using one component less. And this matters when you have to produce, uh, for example, when you're a factor and you want to produce this um, in a serial way, or when you are a, a EMC lab that you have to test every day using one of these devices, well, you want one component less in your, in your chain, of course. Um, why do this happen? And, well, the answer is, is pretty, pretty standard. Uh, the transfer function of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of these transformers is given by this expression here. The ratio between the impedance and this expression, which, is, which contains the ABCD parameters of the transformer. As this is an exponential example in the exponential transformer, the ABCD parameters can be calculated in an analytical way. So you have here the parameters. And uh, it can be seen that, um, taking a look at this expression, it can be seen that the ABCD parameters depends only on, the, uh, on two terms, the ratio between the two impedances and the length of the transformers. So if the ratio between the two impedances in both cases is the same and the length is the same, so TT and TF are going to be identical. And that's the key of, the, of, this, pay, of, this, um, of this strategy. It's to, to, uh, to be able to replace something, simil something of similar, similar um, performance with something of similar performance. And this is the length needs to be the same. Otherwise, uh, of course, you can have more length in the exponential impedance transformer and you will be able to adapt from a lower frequency. However, perhaps these frequencies are not going to be easy to radiate by the antenna itself. So even in that case, this approach uh, wins. Here we have a further example for, uh, for uh, other, you know, we did a focal to diameter relationship of 0.5. So we repeat the, the analytical expression. This is not simulation, this is just the analytical exp expression for FOC FD ratio of 0.3, FD ratio of 0.5, FD ratio of 0.7. And in the, three in the three cases, we're done for the conventional ERA on top and for the exponential, um, exponential profile uh, at the bottom. You can see that in the three cases, there are uh, a few percentage of differences, but this is, uh, this is practically the same uh, result. A few percentages is like less than 1% of difference. So Perfect. these are other profiles because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, two slides to finish. Sure. These are other profiles. Uh, you can do this in Gaussian profile, Klopfenstein profile, logarithmic profile. I mean, there are many profiles to, to test. Um, but with exponential, we show that it works. Further applications for full eras can be seen on this, on this uh, slide. Uh, 
but the same, the same principle can be applied for the full era. Here, you're not going to gain much for the impedance transformation because if you have your source here, when, what do you want to gain? You already have adapt your, uh, your, your, your source. But you gain uh, because if, the, if you're going from a slow, um, small impedance here to a higher impedance here, you're going to gain an amplification factor given by the square root of the ratio between the two impedances. So this uh, give me to the conclusions, uh, which are here uh, on the screen, so you can read it. Uh, and I'm ready for taking one or two questions. Many thanks, many thanks, Dr. Vega. Uh, there are uh, two questions by Dr. Giri. Uh, so the first one is uh, you showed in your introduction uh, the use of uh, rectangular pulse, uh, which is a step or a fast rising. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. for the decaying pulse. For this input, uh, oh, this, this is just uh, illustrative purposes. It's, it's, of course, it's a double exponential signal. I'm just showing something that is very step and very fast. And if you use a square, uh, square pulse, of course, you're going to, you are going to have two, uh, two pulses, one of the beginning and one of the, uh, the trail of the, of the pulse, because this antenna is derivative. So you're going to have two delta Dirac's in, in both cases. But this, in this case, is just for illustrative uh, purposes. For a second question, I don't, know, I don't know if I understand it correctly. Will your uh, curved, curved. curved feeders need to increase aperture blockage? Well, it is more metal, of course. It is more metal, so it might it might uh, produce uh, more blockage. However, remember that the this stuff is up, the aperture of the of the of the reflectors is not uniform. So you are taking away a big part of this metal uh, to the higher of the, you know, away from the center of, of reference. And it's on this center that you have the maximum radiation. So you might have some blockage, but there are strategies to avoid this blockage. Uh, this, the, the simulations are showing, you know, good results. But of course, we need to perform an experiment and see uh, what happens. That's, that's for sure. All right, many thanks, Dr. Vega.